Good evening. I'm John Miko, Executive Director of the Union League Legacy Foundation. Welcome to this evening's Civil War Roundtable. The Legacy Foundation is the nonprofit charity of the Union League of Philadelphia. Inspired and guided by the United States Constitution and the history, the values, and the spirit of the Union League of Philadelphia, the Legacy Foundation's mission is to create more informed citizen leaders. We do this through a host of programs, including exhibits like the one behind me, Ballot Box, uh, through civics education for high school students, college scholarships to tomorrow's citizen leaders, and through a host of programs such as tonight's Civil War Roundtable. In fact, I think we are approaching 70 uh, virtual programs since uh, COVID forced us to go nearly entirely virtual back in April. All this is made possible through the generosity of League members and others who wanna share these values um, with the community. I wanna thank all those people who've given so generously, especially our Founders Circle members. Uh, without you, uh, we can't do uh, any of the work that we do. Uh, tonight's program um, is uh, for those of you on Zoom, uh, we will have q and It'll run about 40 minutes or so. And then at the end, we'll have Q&A. Uh, you can use the icon down in the bottom center, the Q&A icon to ask questions. Please feel free to ask those questions anytime during the course of the program. And uh, our speaker will get to as many of them as is possible. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce the incomparable uh, the famous, the one, the only, the historian of the Union League Legacy Foundation, Mr. Jim Mundy, who will introduce our program. Jim. John, thank you very, very much. And good evening, everybody. And hopefully welcome back to another roundtable. Uh, our last one of the year. And uh, interesting enough, this whole program started way back in January when I first got in touch with Candace and asked her to speak. And here we are finally in December in a very different world. Uh, so, and tonight's topic is going to be spectacular because uh, there's still not enough written yet about the participation of women at all the different levels during the Civil War itself. And that's what's going to make tonight so much special because it's about generals' wives and the role that they played in shaping the war, believe it or not. Uh, so it is my great, great pleasure to introduce Candace. Um, and, and she's got a great biography, so I'm actually going to read it. I normally don't read it, but this one's too good not to read. So, so Candace was born on Guam to a U.S. Navy hospital corpsman and his intrepid Hoosier wife. And Candace attended more than a half dozen schools before her high school graduation. Uh, I, I did that, but I kept getting thrown out of them, so Candace did it the right way. The one constant in her nomadic life were libraries from Saipan to Norfolk, Virginia, that her parents made the family's first stop in every household move. And that explains a lot. Good for libraries and good for your parents. With an undergraduate degree in journalism from the University of Illinois and a law degree from Georgetown University, it was only after a career on Capitol Hill as an aide to the late Congressman Charlie Wilson, and yes, that Charlie Wilson of Charlie Wilson's war, and as a lobbyist with her husband that she discovered her true intellectual passion. Returning to school in 2006, she earned a master's degree in history with a concentration in military history from George Washington University. Candace's work has appeared in the New York Times, the Journal of Military History, the Michigan War Studies Review. She's spoken at the Society of Military History Annual Conference, Film and History Annual Conference, and the Society for Civil War Historians. And as you can imagine, she's lectured at all the different academies and even George Washington University. But on top of all of this, she is also an award-winning poet whose work was selected for inclusion in District Lines, an anthology published by the renowned independent uh, bookstore Politics and Prose. So Candace presently serves on the editorial advisory board of the Journal of Military History and is a member of the Ulysses S. and Julia D. Grant Historical Home Advisory Board in Detroit, Michigan. She has served on the board of directors of President Lincoln's Cottage at the National Soldiers Home in Washington, D.C., and is past president of the Johann Fust Library Foundation in Boca Grande, Florida, where she spends half the year with her husband, Lindsay. They spend the other half in Lindsay's home state of Wyoming. So ladies and gentlemen, please uh, give a, a warm Union League shout out or a wave out to our speaker, Candace Shai Hooper. Candace, take it away. Thank you very much, Jim. I, I appreciate you reading all of that. Um, it, uh, uh, it, it makes me feel like I'm sitting right in my website. So I appreciate it. Um, I am delighted to be here. This was a re it is a real honor to have been invited to speak um, to the at the Union League Club. I'm sorry we 
can't all be there together this evening. I, um, I always try to personalize my talks for every venue. And so with this talk, I had already gone through my book and picked out a number of places where Philadelphia comes into play. And one of the problems with being on Zoom and not seeing the audiences, I'm not going to be able to say, stop me if you've heard this one. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you all of the little tales that I have about Philadelphia that are woven into the tapestry of this book. And even though you probably have heard many of them. And if you're a Civil War roundtable person, you probably know a great deal about a lot that I'm going to be talking about, but you might not know that much about the women. Um, I'm going to uh, begin with a, a little slideshow here and, um, and uh, let that take our, uh, our talk in the direction that, uh, that John and Jim both spoke about, where we're talking about uh, wives of generals. Um, in all of Civil War uh, historiography, there's actually a great deal that has been written about uh, Confederate women in the war. There has been less uh, written about Union women in the war, um, but there has been really very little written about officers' wives. And um, this, my book fills that little gap, but it's really because my mother was a military wife, as, as you heard. She um, uh, was a Navy wife and in the Navy, they say that that's the hardest job there is in, in the Navy to be a Navy wife. Like I'm sure that it's the same in the Army and all of these women were Army wives. And I, I'm just going to take my little cursor and, and begin to with just the names of the women in the order we'll be talking about them. This is Jesse Fremont, Nellie McClellan, Ellen Sherman, and Julia Grant. Now, um, the, the overall structure of the book is four parts, one for each of the women and talking about their husbands too. I do talk a lot about various battles that their husbands fought. Um, because the wives come in and out of those stories. Um, but in the end, what I found was that I've got two sets of generals. Um, one set that was not quite so successful, the other that was more successful. And obviously there are many reasons for that that are buried in the, the psyches of those men. But as they say, often say the old adage that behind every successful man, um, there is a woman. And I had to ask myself, so who's the woman or the women behind the not so successful men? To give you a one photo or one image um, summary of the careers of these men, although I'm sure you're familiar with them, I drew up a little chart. Um, and I, I promise you that the other slides in this series are much better looking than this chart. But this chart will give you a sense of um, the, the careers or this, the Civil War service of each of these men. Um, and you see here on the left, I've got the various military grades, Colonel, Brigadier General, Major General, and then Lieutenant General, and I've got the years of the war. Um, so we have first here Fremont, and you see he was one of the first four major generals appointed by Lincoln just the month after Fort Sumter in May of 1861. He was made uh, major general. He was a, considered a political general. Um, because he was considered somebody who could attract and inspire people. And we'll talk a bit more about his background in a moment. But as you see from this line, he stayed a major general only till the fall of 1862, when he was relieved of command by Abraham Lincoln. Similarly, McClellan was made major general. He was also one of those first four. Um, 
And similarly, he retained the grade of major general until he was also relieved of command by um, President Lincoln in the fall of 1862 after the Battle of Antietam. Uh, he did, of course, uh, take on the title of general in chief for a time, but he never uh, was increased in grade. Now, down here, we have Sherman S. who uh, went into back into military service in the summer of 1861 as a colonel. And there you see that in his career trajectory was um, not too long after the Battle of Bull Run, or Manassas, he was made Brigadier General shortly after Shiloh. He was made Major General and he retained that grade. Grant got into it later even than Sherman and he was followed sort of a similar trajectory until the spring of 1864 when uh, the Congress and the president revived the grade of Lieutenant General that had last been held by George Washington and uh, Grant was commissioned Lieutenant General and he retained that grade. So you have these two very similar generals and these two very similar generals. Now understand that all of these men had served in the military before uh, had had been in the Mexican War, had left the military for various reasons, um, and and came back fresh into the war um, when the Civil War started. Um, so these are the two sets of generals we'll be talking about, and the first couple that we're going to talk about is uh, the Fremonts, and. One thing I want you to see here is how young these people were at the time. The Fremonts were the oldest in 1861. They were um, uh, a couple that uh, became a known, they were sort of a 19th century power couple um, from the beginning. John Charles Fremont had gotten the nickname the Pathfinder for his expeditions uh, as an army topographical uh, officer uh, who had mapped routes to the West um, in the early 1840s. Jessie Benton was the daughter of Thomas Hart Benton, one of the first senators from Missouri, who raised her, his daughter Jessie as if she were a son. He gave her a superb education. By the time she was a teenager, she could speak three languages. She uh, read in Greek and Latin, and she devoured the political aspect of um, her father's life and, and became sort of joined at the hip with him um, as an assistant uh, in writing speeches and in, in following the political events of the day. But as happened in the 19th century, um, she had everything going for her to be a politician on her own, except her sex. And so when she met John Charles Fremont and fell in love with him, she realized that he would be the one who would be the politician out front. Um, and in my mind, uh, took on many of the aspects of what has been known as a stage mother. She managed his career and she, she put herself as far forward as she could while pushing him uh, onto greater and greater things. Um, one of those things was, as I'm sure you all know, uh, the fact that he was the first Republican candidate for president in our country's history. He was nominated that at a convention at the music, Musical Fund Hall in Philadelphia in 1856. Um, his running mate, William Dayton, beat out a lesser known uh, former congressman from Illinois named Abraham Lincoln for the vice presidential nomination. Um, but as we all know, they lost. James Buchanan won. 
And that set the stage for um, the downward spiral toward uh, the breakup of the country when uh, Lincoln was elected in 1860. So in 1861, as I said before, Fremont was one of uh, Lincoln's first choices uh, for, for Major General, and he gave him command of the Western Military Department headquartered in St. Louis. Jesse rushed out to St. Louis, leased a mansion, set up offices for Fremont and his, um, and his entourage, and set up her own office in front of his. Um, she was the gatekeeper to him. She wrote out many of his orders. She sent the telegrams to Lincoln demanding more troops and more material. In St. Louis, she was known as General Jesse. And one person actually observed that she was really the better man of the two. So you get a sense of how she was perceived um, and how she operated. Uh, and Fremont, on the other hand, uh, was overwhelmed by the challenges facing him in Missouri in 1861. It was similar to Kansas in that there was literally guerrilla warfare going on there. Missouri was a slave state that had chosen to remain with the Union and things were completely out of control. Um, and in order to try to get some control, Fremont decided he would issue an emancipation proclamation. He, he would, by order, by his own order, free the slaves of any rebel who picked up arms against the United States. Um, he wrote out this proclamation. As it so happened, a man from Philadelphia was there that evening when he previewed it to his wife. And so Edward Davis, who was a devoted abolitionist, a Quaker from Philadelphia, was also read the proclamation. And while he agreed wholeheartedly with the contents, he said that he thought it was not a good idea for Fremont to issue this on his own, that it could create problems and that he should at least run it by the president of the United States. Jesse overrode that. And so as it turned out, the president of the United States learned that slaves were to be freed in Missouri in 1861 by reading the proclamation in a newsletter, in a newspaper. Lincoln understood immediately that at that point in the war, almost no one had signed up to free slaves. They had signed up to reunite the Union and that this would create enormous problems in the other border states, especially Kentucky, where he's famous was famously said, you know, uh, I, I would like to have God on my side, but I must have Kentucky. And so he sent a message to Fremont to revoke his order. Fremont refused. Um, and sent a letter saying, if you'd like the order revoked, you should revoke it because if I do, then it's going to make me look weak. That wasn't a very politic uh, response to a president. And shortly after that message was sent, um, he and Jesse decided to send another message, a lengthier message that laid out his plans and his strategy for actually bringing uh, Missouri and the Western District more under control. And Jesse decided that rather than wait for that to go by mail, that she would carry it and she would tell President Lincoln um, the, why that proclamation should stand. So she got on a train in St. Louis, stayed on that train for two days and a night, arrived in Washington, went to the Willard Hotel, um, late, late on a Sunday night, sent a note to the president at the White House at nine o'clock at night saying, um, I've arrived, I have important messages from General Fremont. Um, I would like to see you tonight or, or tomorrow morning latest. Uh, Lincoln sent her a note, it's preserved in her papers. It says, um, now, 
a Lincoln. So she walks over to the White House and it doesn't go well. Now I used to be a lobbyist and so I tried to pick apart um, both sides of this encounter from the accounts that were written. And uh, it, it is very clear to me that Jesse um, was lecturing the president uh, about how her husband's proclamation could help bring Great Britain in on the side of the union rather than uh, really trying to focus on what, what the president's response had been and how to deal with that. Um, the upshot of it was that Lincoln insisted that the order be revoked. Um, Jesse uh, took great umbrage at her, him calling her uh, quite the female politician and um, left the Red Room uh, after essentially challenging uh, President Lincoln to a duel with her husband, um, which of course never took place. But uh, Fremont continued to distribute the proclamation and when Lincoln found that out later, he relieved him of command. But that wasn't the last time that, um, though, and here's the, here the proclamation, um, that wasn't the last time that uh, the Fremonts were in Lincoln's crosshairs. Um, the proclamation was bad enough, but a year later, Lincoln convinced himself that the president could issue such a proclamation. So they were sort of on the same page there, but in fact, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation didn't go far enough for many Republicans. And so there was a splinter group of Republicans that styled themselves the Radical Democracy Party that nominated Fremont for president in 1864. And so you have Fremont and his running mate Cochran as the splinter Republicans, the Radical Democracy Party. You have Lincoln and Johnson, well actually Lincoln and Johnson running as the National Union Party, which is how the mainstream Republican Party styled itself for that election. And you had um, McClellan and Pendleton running as the Democratic Party, which fortunately kept its own name that, that year because it was, would have been very hard to figure out who was who on the ballot. Um, you see that both uh, McClellan and Fremont are running in their military uniforms against the man who had appointed them to those positions. Uh, this uh, election was heading, was barreling down the road when uh, in July, uh, Jesse Fremont realized that the splintering of the Republican vote could possibly make McClellan president. And if that were to happen, McClellan had opposed the Emancipation Proclamation. His first goal was to have peace um, and he really uh, did not care that much about the issue of slavery. And as much as Jesse loved Fremont, um, she hated slavery. And so in the one great uh, uh, favor she did her husband, was she went behind his back and she uh, maneuvered him out of the uh, presidential election, leaving just Lincoln and McClellan to duke it out. And fortunately it came out right. And so we are on to the McClellans. And here you have the youngest of the group. And this is really sort of shockingly young for people to be in such important positions during the war. You have um, George McClellan, 34 in 1861, Nellie Marcy McClellan, 26. Now, uh, of course, McClellan is from Philadelphia. His family is from Philadelphia. Uh, his father was a very prominent surgeon, helped to found Jefferson Medical College. Um, his mother was uh, top uh, 
uh, socialite, uh, entertained, um, and uh, including Daniel Webster uh, was a frequent visitor, but they were active in education in the city as well. Now, Nellie Marcy was a celebrated beauty. Her father was an army captain, Randolph Barnes Marcy, and he was actually um, quite the explorer as well. He led a number of expeditions um, and they settled in uh, Philadelphia um, on one of his, one of Captain Marcy's expeditions, young George McClellan uh, was assigned. And when he saw a photograph, possibly even this one of young Nellie that um, her father showed him, he fell in love. He fell in love before he ever saw her. He decided that, that she was to be his wife. And when she first met him, um, he proposed to her. Now, she uh, had been very well educated as well. Um, she was in love with another man who had gone to West Point. And that man had actually been George McClellan's roommate, Ambrose Powell Hill. She accepted an engagement ring from him, um, but her mother forced her to break off the engagement. Um, she told her daughter that uh, A.P. Hill had a venereal disease, although we don't know how she got that information or whether it was even true. Um, it was something that, that could be uh, a charge that could be made in secret and um, in private and uh, forced her daughter to give uh, Hill back his ring. And of course, Nellie never told him why. He later found out about it and that's a whole other story I'm uh, be willing to talk about in questions. But uh, after she turned down uh, McClellan after she uh, was forced to break off her engagement with A.P. Hill, she rejected five other suitors. Finally, the day came when George McClellan now uh, not in the army anymore. He was now president of the Illinois Central Railroad, um, which had the highest salary of any civilian job in the United States. He was a handsome man. He had never stopped loving her. He had never stopped writing to her mother. Um, her mother was his constant pen pal. And so he asked her to marry him again. And you had Nellie, who was at that point 26 years old, on the verge of spinsterhood uh, in the 19th century. And she accepted his, um, accepted his ring and married him. And the two of them promised each other that they would write every day they were apart. Now, not knowing that they would be apart because the war was on the horizon, um, they took the pledge and they did it. And there are hundreds of his letters that Nellie saved. Um, her letters, not so much, uh, only a few, but she saved so many of his. And his are, to put it mildly, very difficult to read. Here's an excerpt from one of them. Uh, in June of 1861, just one month after he had become Major General appointed by Lincoln, it is perfectly sickening to have to work with such people and to see the fate of the nation in such hands. It is terrible to stand by and see the cowardice of the president, the vileness of Seward, the rascality of Cameron. Wells is an old woman, Bates is a fool. The only man of courage and sense in the cabinet is Blair, and I do not altogether fancy him. Um, what comes out in those letters is his narcissism, his paranoia, his delusions, um, and uh, her letters are not so easy to read either. First, just literally her letters are not so easy to read. I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, what's called cross writing that was very popular during that time as a way to save on paper and therefore on postage. Um, so you write across 
one sheet of paper, you turn it halfway and you write again. And then if you really have something to say, you can turn it diagonally and write. But just the cross writing alone is tough. Um, but figuratively too, her letters are difficult because even of the few that we have left, um, you take those five letters of hers and then you look at his letters in which he's responding to her. So if they write every day, you can imagine that he's, he's reacting to a lot of what she writes. She's egging him on. If he says something bad about Lincoln, she doubles down on it. Um, if he uh, flirts with uh, uh, resigning uh, his command, she says, you know, they don't deserve you. Um, and, and, and at some points she says things like, you know, Halleck should be so happy that you are actually doing what he's asked you to do when he's being ordered to do something by uh, the general in chief. Um, so uh, her letters are difficult to, to read um, as well. She encouraged his every notion, especially that Lincoln was his enemy. And that was really one of his, one of the things that, that was his downfall, that he could never trust that Lincoln really was supporting him. But that is, that is the problem with somebody who is a narcissist. Now, after he was relieved from command, they went off to Europe. They, they were there at the end of the war. He came back, he had a successful career as an engineer. Um, he was uh, governor of New Jersey for two terms. Um, so she was first lady of New Jersey, but he died very suddenly at the age of, I think it was 58, he had a heart attack and died and left an unfinished memoir that his literary executor decided he would rush into publication. Now, of course, only, only um, George McClellan would have thought that he needed a literary executor, but this man um, saw that Grant's uh, memoirs were selling uh, fabulously uh, and McClellan died the same year as Grant. And so he took the half finished uh, memoir that uh, George had written. He sort of stuffed it with uh, some other items that he could uh, pull from notes. And he asked Nellie for her letters from him. Um, and assumedly to, uh, to fill in the gaps because uh, McClellan had written about everything he was doing in his lengthy letters to her. Now, most widows of famous men interfere with biographies of their husbands and they do it in one of two ways. They either work to burnish their husband's reputations by publishing their own uh, accounts and trying to fill that space. And that would be somebody like Libby Custer, or they actually uh, create things that will be used to be used by biographers, um, letters that didn't exist. And that would be, for example, uh, LaSalle Corbell Pickett on uh, George Pickett's widow did that, or as in the case with Martha Washington, they destroy the letters. She destroyed all of um, their personal correspondence uh, right after he died. And that is a common thing too. In fact, widows of famous men are so notorious for trying to interfere with biographers that, that there is sort of a motto of biographers that actually one, uh, one biographer of many famous people took as the title for her book and it is shoot the widow. But in the case of Nellie McClellan, of course, they didn't have to shoot the widow. She gave him the letters. She gave the executor the letters, thinking I'm sure that he was going to use them as a resource. Uh, instead, he included them verbatim, over 250 letters in this, bio, in this memoir, which is the title of it is, McClellan's own story. You see it's by George McClellan. Um, 
And only in the finest print uh, within one of the introductions do you get a sense that maybe he wasn't the one that put these letters in there. But at the time, it was shocking. It was outrageous. People were uh, not only, I mean, they were amazed at, at all of the other things that were wrong with, that, with McClellan's memoirs, but they were just aghast that he had included all of these personal letters, which revealed him to be, um, as I said, a paranoid narcissist. So literally because of his wife, um, McClellan has been damned for eternity um, by his own words. The Shermans had a very, very different uh, uh, relationship uh, from any of these wives and uh, from, from many of the couples uh, then and now. They grew up right next to each other in houses uh, on a hillside in Lancaster, Ohio. Their fathers were best friends. And when William Tecumseh Sherman's father died, um, uh, he, was, he was a judge and he was a circuit judge and he was riding the circuit. And when he died, uh, Sherman was nine years old. Uh, Ellen Sherman was four years old. Um, she had several, she had three brothers and a sister. Um, her father uh, walked down the hill to the Sherman house and offered to Mrs. Sherman, to the widow of his best friend, that he would take one of her 11 fatherless and penniless children in and raise him. And so according to family legend, she chose little redheaded Kump, as he was called, because he was the brightest. And so Kump walked up the hill and became a foster sibling with Ellen Sherman and her family. They never forgot that they were from different families, that they had been childhood friends before. She went off to Catholic schools Catholic boarding schools, and later he went off to West Point. But they wrote letters always. And even as teenagers, you can read these letters, which are at the um, archives of the University of Notre Dame. You can read the letters between the two of them, and you can chart their journey from childhood friends to uh, romantic interests. Um, and uh, in examining those letters and in reading so much about, uh, as much as I could about Ellen, mostly through biographies of Sherman, uh, I, I realized that this uh, portrait of Ellen, which is in the Smithsonian uh, National Portrait uh, Gallery, um, is one of the very few images of her that exists, and it's, it's one of the youngest. Um, as you saw with Nellie, there was a photograph of her as a young child. There, there, there are photographs of her siblings as children. They were from a relatively wealthy family. Why weren't there any pictures of Ellen? Well, the more I dug, uh, the more I got into this notion that appears in many of his biographies that she was a hypochondriac, that she maybe was sick some of the time, but she wasn't really that sick. Um, and, but I did find letters from her priest to her bishop. And one of them said that um, Ellen Sherman uh, is at death's door from scrofula. Now scrofula was a disease that was uh, widely known uh, at that time in the early um, 18 to the mid 1800s. It is a disease that's uh, contracted by drinking the milk of tubercular cows and it expresses itself in swollen glands. And that may not sound like much, but um, I'm going to show you a picture of uh, not of Ellen, but of an anonymous victim of scrofula. This is not one of the worst cases. I advise you not to Google scrofula um, when you're having dinner. Um, but 
this, this is how it manifests itself in boils. And then later you would, I could find letters where she was saying, well, I have this tonic or I have this powder and I have this one boil here. And um, you have to think about this young woman, beautiful young woman who's afflicted like this and it, it followed her through the rest of her life. Um, but the other thing you have to think of, and this, is, this was an insight that I, I, I wasn't expecting, but it says to me, it says a great deal about Sherman's character, that he could look past this disfiguring disease and love Ellen and marry her. Um, and, and so it, it gave me, it seemed to give me insight into both of these people to see this, um, to, to actually understand what she was suffering. Now, Sherman was a very excitable man. He was six foot tall, redheaded, full of nervous energy um, and had his own demons. And uh, some of them began manifesting themselves when he was given a command uh, in the Department of the Cumberland um, in late 1861. And so he's in an area where uh, uh, the Confederate army is uh, gathering and he begins to be concerned, perhaps overly concerned about the forces facing him, about the unreadiness of his um, uh, civilian troops, men who mostly had, had not been in the regular army and, and were poorly armed, very poorly armed at that time. Um, and so in October of that year, he essentially had a nervous breakdown. His uh, commander uh, at that time was uh, Henry Halleck, who told him to go home, get some rest. He'd bring him back in a less stressful position, which is what Sherman had asked for. Um, and Sherman took that advice. He and Ellen uh, were um, getting him back to normal. Um, and he was about to go back into the field when in uh, December, not just the Cincinnati commercial newspaper, which is where he, uh, Ellen and, and Kump read it, but um, in all of the news, in many of the newspapers in the North, all at the same time had this article, had this, the, this uh, announcement that, that General William T. Sherman uh, had been, was insane. Um, and that, of course, set Sherman back. That threw him into a deep depression. And he told Ellen that he wanted to hide. Um, well, Ellen didn't want to hide at all. She wanted to fight and she came out guns blazing. She wrote to Henry Hallett uh, asking him to, to offer some, some uh, public proof of her husband's uh, fitness for command. She wrote to President Lincoln asking the same thing. She wrote to the newspaper editors lashing out at this, um, but not receiving word back from Lincoln in particular. She decided to do what Jesse had done. She got on the train and she went to Washington. Now she was with her father, um, who uh, had been the country's first interior secretary um, and was a man well respected. But in that meeting with Lincoln, she uh, stated very plainly that um, she wanted, she, she hoped that Lincoln would give, make some public uh, signifier of his confidence in Sherman. And Lincoln would not do that, but he gave her this advice to give her husband that he should go back to work and in doing the work as best he could, he would be raised up uh, to his rightful place in the army and that he, that he, Lincoln had confidence that in Sherman that he would be. And so uh, Ellen left 
uh, the Red Room, uh, not challenging Lincoln to a duel with her husband, but went back and told Sherman that. And Sherman took that advice. And um, shortly thereafter, Halleck sent him to Cairo, Illinois to supply Grant's uh, uh, expedition to take Fort Donelson. And that was the beginning of their partnership, the beginning of their friendship, um, and the beginning of the, the team that really sort of won the war for the United States. Um, Sherman always gets the, the, the blame for being a terror to the South, of hating the Confederates, of hating um, uh, slave owners. Um, but in fact, it was Ellen who was the one who was the most fierce against all of that. Sherman had gone to school with them. He had, he had taught um, uh, uh, Southern boys. Um, he, his fight really, he felt, was not with the, the soldiers, but with the politicians who had created the situation that sent them all to war, but not Ellen. Ellen was um, virulently anti-slavery and, uh, and angered, especially at Catholics who were Confederates and secessionists. But here's a sample of her writing and she was a beautiful writer and I quote many of her letters at length because she really uh, not only had insight but had the words to, to give it voice. And this one is particularly um, uh, memorable. It is hard to think that Freeman could sacrifice country and honor for the privilege of whipping Negro wenches. Um, Ellen uh, helped keep her husband in the fight. Not only at that time he was judged insane, but there were several other, there were numerous other bumps in the road for Sherman as many of you um, who, who know this history know. And Ellen was always the one that kept him in the fight. And this was despite the fact that during the war, she lost two sons and um, young sons. One was just an infant, the other was a nine-year-old son, but she never asked Cump to come back home and, and comfort her or the other children. She urged him to stay in the fight and win the war. She had a vision of his importance to the war from the very beginning of the war that I'm not sure even Sherman had. Um, and she fought to keep him in the war. Now our last couple, um, Ulysses and Julia, they really lived the, gre the greatest love story in American history. I'm convinced, I've, I'll, I'll debate anybody who, who finds another one, but um, they're at least in the top two. Uh, Sherm, uh, Grant, of course, um, uh, from Ohio, went to West Point, one of his roommates was Frederick Dent. And after graduation, he was posted, Grant was posted to St. Louis to, uh, at, at Benton Barracks. And he visited his roommate's family at their plantation um, outside of St. Louis. And that is where he met Julia. And it was love at first sight. Um, it truly was for both of them. And sight is the operative word because one of the things that I think uh, endeared Julia to Grant was that she was not um, the most perfect socialite and he being a rather shy man himself um, would have been uh, overwhelmed uh, by most of the young women he met. Julia, on the other hand, was a warm and, 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 and happy and, and caring young woman, but she had an eye defect. And it's most obvious because you can see in nearly every picture of her, she is taking a profile. She is showing a profile or at most a three quarters shot. So here she is at City Point with their son, Jesse. Um, here she is 
Matthew Brady's studio in New York in 1864. Note this dress. She bought it in Philadelphia. Um, and here they are after his presidency, um, taking a tour of a silver mine in Nevada. Um, this looks sort of like Ma and Pa Kettle, but here she is, she's, she's so intent on showing only a profile that she looks like she's snubbing her husband. This is, as I say, a rare full face photo of Julia and you see what's going on there with her eyes and why she was so self-conscious, but it's, strabismus as it's called is does not just make you look um, uh, cross-eyed but it actually interferes with your sight the most Im important aspect of it is that you see everything at, in two dimensions you are what they call stereo blind it's as if the entire world were a painting rather than 3d objects rather than objects that you're looking at and as a result of that, you have no depth perception. Um, it makes it harder to read and harder to write. Now, Julia could read and she could write, but she was raised on a plantation. She had slaves to do her every bidding. Um, and so she grew up uh, with the, the very decided view that if she really didn't want to do something, she didn't have to do it. And if she just barely didn't want to do something, she didn't have to do it. And so when uh, Grant went off to the Mexican War um, before they were engaged, but they were uh, talking about being engaged, um, he wrote to her passionately and regularly, and she wrote nearly not at all. His letters to her during that time, and they've all been saved, they've all been published, uh, are pitiful to read, in fact. He's begging her in every letter to write to him. So he comes back from the Mexican War, they get married, he's then posted out to Washington Territory. Um, by the time he gets there, uh, he knows that his wife uh, has had their second child but it's six more months before she sends him a letter telling him that. He's nearly crazed with um, concern and, and with loneliness. Um, and uh, uh, that's when he begins to drink and that's when he leaves the army, comes back and works in his father's uh, leather works business. By the time the civil war comes, he's unhappy with that. He and Julia both know that the army is, is the place for him. And um, he decides to go back, but they know that they, or they fear at least that the same thing will happen, that she will not write, that he will become lonely. He will be unhappy. Um, and so uh, Julia decides that it's actually gonna be easier for her to travel to see him and to be with him as much as she can during the war, that'll be easier than writing letters. Go figure. But that's what she does. And- um, Excuse me, Candace. Yes? Three minute warning. Okay, I'm just about there. So Great. when- Thanks. Thank you. So um, when, uh, so she, she travels with him or she, and she travels to be with him. And so I mapped her travels and this is what you see. This is her map. I mapped all of the wives travels. And what you see is that she traveled, I calculated it out. She traveled 10,000 miles during the civil war to be with her husband. Now she had many impacts on Grant. One of them is, as I mentioned, she uh, had slaves and so he was acquainted with slaves. He even worked alongside slaves. So he was comfortable putting them in combat position. She cared about appearances. And early in 1861, um, Grant had one of those awful facial hair uh, uh, styles that men seemed to go for during the Civil War. When she first came to see him in Cairo, she told him to shave it off. And it's a good thing because otherwise we would be carrying this around in our pockets instead of this. But the last thing, and this one really involves um, 
where we're or where we're talking or the, the forum here. And you may know about this, the great sanitary fair in uh, 1864 in New York, where this sword was going to be given to the general receiving the highest number of votes. Votes were cast a dollar apiece. And uh, Julia Grant went there. She cast her vote for McClellan, her dollar for McClellan when asked why. She said, well, you never vote for yourself. Of course, I want my husband to win. But in school, we always voted for the May Queen and we never voted for ourselves. Um, and the newspapers ate that up. And so she triumphed over beautiful Nellie and accomplished um, Jesse who were there uh, trying to get people to vote for their husbands. But the sword was won not by Julia's $1 vote, but by the $500, $500 worth of votes that were telegraphed in by the Union League Club of Philadelphia on the last day of the voting. And so uh, Grant got that sword. Um, and Julia also was instrumental in the Grants not going to Ford's theater on the night of the 14th. Um, as you see here, this was an ad that says that Grant was on his way to Philadelphia um, and that he was going to be at the theater, but Julia vetoed that because she and Mary hadn't gotten along at City Point. And so they were not there um, when Lincoln died. Uh, and fortunately so, and I talk about some of the counterfactuals in that. But um, the, the, the stories that I tell in this book uh, are really meant to be bigger than just these four women, to, but to give a flavor of what it was like to be the wife of a military officer during the Civil War, and even beyond that, to really give a sense of what um, wives or now spouses go through um, in the military families. And I hope that um, you give some thought to that uh, as I do every day. Thank you. Great, hey, uh, lived up to billing. Thanks so much, Candace. That was really fantastic. Um, I always like it when I learn stuff, that's great. So we have a just a few minutes for a few, a few questions. So we'll start with Mr. Strasbaugh. Thank you for joining us again, Mr. Strasbaugh. Was Nellie McClellan involved in her son's political career to become mayor of New York City? That is, um, that's a very interesting question. And I'm not sure that I, that I know for a fact, but I will tell you, she was very uninvolved, um, except at that sword contest in her husband's campaign for president. Um, and so I think it very unlikely that she got involved in her son's contest. She seemed to be fairly apolitical. Okay, already. Uh, Mr. Dunning, who I think your question about Sherman and his depression was answered already. Uh, so I'll skip that one for the time being. And then, uh, Candace, who is the other couple in the top two love stories? <laughs> oh, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm leaving that open. I'm leaving that open. I'm, I'm, I'm going to claim that the Grants were, uh, are the great American love story. And you particularly get that sense in his final days. But um, uh, I'll leave it up to someone else. Okay, all right, uh, you dodged that bullet. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> right, we've got one more coming up. Uh, why did Grant never drink alcohol in Julia's presence? Was it about the relationship that caused him not to do so? Well, I, I think what I was trying to get at was that uh, the general consensus is that he, that he drank when he was lonely or when he was bored. And he was neither lonely nor bored in Julia's presence. I mean, the two of them were, uh, you know, just this complete couple. He would read novels to her. I mean, they loved being together. But, but truly, um, you know, that was that in the early days having her there wasn't because that would keep him from drinking. It was because that would keep his equilibrium. Now, maybe an outgrowth of that was not drinking. But I don't buy the sense that she was sent there. Somebody once said she was sent to Cairo to stop him from drinking. I don't believe that at all. 
Okay. All right. Boy, now the questions are popping up and we've run out of time. So let me maybe, I think this one's important though. I like this one a lot. So, I mean, I like them all, but um, so did military wives have support networks for each other? I could not find, um, I couldn't find any. Now I think, I think the situation was different in the Confederacy because so many of the general's wives ended up in Richmond. Um, and so they were a natural group uh, together and they, if you read uh, any of the memoirs, you get that sense that they saw each other at dinner and all. But, but the, the Union military wives were scattered all over and they mostly, well, they stayed home except you'll see from my maps that they traveled a great deal. They tried to be with their husbands. Um, but, um, but, but they were, they were a scattered group and there wasn't, you know, there wasn't the internet, there wasn't anything to right. keep them together. Okay. All right. Uh, we've gone past the seven o'clock mark and we're starting to lose participants. So, uh, and we've got some questions coming up, but I'm afraid to go down that rabbit hole. So forgive me. Uh, for not getting to them, but I would like to just say that uh, Candace is working on a new book about a special agent of the United States Postal Service during the Civil War, uh, whose efforts played a vital role against the Ku Klux Klan during Reconstruction. And so I see a future, civil, you know, return to the Civil Roundtable. So when do you think that will be in print, Candace? Anytime soon? Um, it's it's to be published in the fall of 2022. Perfect. All right. Great timing there. Okay, you'd think we even planned that one out. Uh, so thanks for glad to hear that one. Uh, also, like to think I think, and also just another league connection. The Edward Davis you mentioned uh, during the talk about the Fremonts, I believe, was a league member named Edward M. Davis, who was uh -huh. the law of uh, James and Lucretia Mott. So uh -huh. interesting stuff there. So uh, and then, uh, folks, if you really want to say thank you to Candace, you, when this is over, you jump on Amazon and you click on books and you buy a copy of. Lincoln's General's Wives, please uh, give it. Christmas is coming up. Holidays are coming up. Everybody wants a book for a present. So there you go. And Candace, I think that if you, people wanted them individually signed, you would do book plates or something? I, yes. Well, I, I have, I have um, bookmarks that I'm happy okay. to sign. Okay. So how do people get in touch with you to do that then? Well, um, uh, they can go on my website or okay. maybe, or they can contact you. You can contact me, whatever works best. Sure. They can, they can contact me and I'd be happy to forward it. Okay, so everybody, so it's mundyj, M-U-N-D-Y-J at unionleague.org. You know how to find me. Be happy to do that. Um, and this has been fun. Uh, and I, I, I really, I love the contrast between all four couples. It was really great to see. So, so uh, Candace, thank you so very, very, very much for joining us this evening. We greatly appreciate it. And I hope uh, you and, and uh, Lindsay have a, a, a wonderful holiday season down in Florida. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been an honor and I hope everybody has a wonderful holiday season and that we all get together at some point when this is all better. By the time your book comes out, we'll be open for business and you'll be in Philadelphia. Great. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks everybody. And don't forget uh, December 7th, library hour, December 9th, public affairs, uh, two really good looking programs, especially the one, I mean, they're both great. Filled off in the revolutionary period, and then Dr. Derek Pitts from the Franklin Institute can't can't lose. So, thanks everybody for joining us. We greatly appreciate it. So remember, it's still a little scary out there. So stay safe and stay well. Have a good night.